Hey everybody, welcome to Accounting 2210, Tax Accounting. I'm Professor Martin. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at reporting entities and the tax forms that they file. There are certain entities that are required to file a tax return with the IRS. So today we're going to talk about what those entities are, who they are, and what forms do they have to file with the IRS. So before we get into that, you've all paid taxes, I'm sure at some point or another, you've probably either wrote a check to the IRS in April, or maybe you've just looked at your tax stub throughout the year and thought, you know, what is all this money that is showing being taken out for federal withholding? Who came up with all this? Who made it okay to get all up in my paycheck? Well, the U.S. Constitution, Amendment Number 16 to be exact, is what gives our federal government the authority to not only levy an income tax, but to collect those taxes. And the way that they kind of determine what is taxable is really kind of ingenious. If you're trying to collect money, everything's taxable, unless the government says it's not. So any kind of income that you can get your hands on, whether it be, you know, your salary or wage that you get from working a job, or maybe, you know, you have stocks and dividends that you're selling, or even, you know, maybe you're selling dime bags on a street corner. Uh, even though that's illegal, it doesn't matter. The amendment says, and the IRS takes the position that any income that you get your hands on is taxable, unless the IRS says, no, we're not going to count that as income. So that's a pretty broad definition of income. Uh, right there and from time to time you'll see people who say you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna beat the irs and come up with this idea that uh, i don't have to pay taxes because i'm not really a citizen or the irs isn't a real thing or they have no authority over me the irs has categorized these kind of arguments as frivolous tax arguments and they are always defeated and always beaten down in court if they even make it that far in fact, the IRS actually puts out a document that shows all the different frivolous arguments that have already been proven to be wrong in court. And if you try to take one of these arguments and you know you don't pay taxes because you say the filing of a tax return is voluntary or I'm not a citizen of the U.S., you're not going to be looked upon very favorably with the IRS and you're not going to win for certain. And from time to time, you see people that are peddling these kind of creative tax schemes and they, they just don't work. Uh, if you try to take one of these positions, you are looking at up to $25,000 in fines, not to mention all the interest and penalties that you'll pay on top of whatever you didn't report or whatever you didn't pay taxes on to begin with. Um, but you can see there's just all kinds of different frivolous tax arguments. So the IRS is a real thing, paying taxes is a real thing, and the point is you better do it uh, like you're supposed to. So that's what we're here, right? We're here to learn how to make sure that we pay all the taxes that we're supposed to pay. And our clients that we have, they pay all the taxes that they're supposed to pay. The goal of the U.S. tax system, aside just to get money to fund the government, uh, there's all kinds of goals that the tax system kind of pursues. And we can kind of divide those up between social goals and economic goals. And one of the reasons why the tax system is so freaking complicated is because so many different political interest groups have their hands in, in the tax law pot. And to kind of give you an idea of that, under social goals, I have this idea that if you want less of something, you tax it, right? Isn't that what we have with, you know, like cigarette and alcohol taxes? Uh, the government wants to kind of tax that to maybe discourage people from consuming those products. Uh, if you want more of something, you subsidize it. So we see in the tax code that you can get a tax break if you have a, a home that you own and you're paying interest on that mortgage. Uh, we can see in the tax code that if you give money to charity, you might be able to get a tax deduction for that. Those are social goals. The fact that the IRS wants to give people an incentive to do things like settle down and own a home or give money to charity or maybe install solar panels and become energy efficient. So those are things that are kind of built into the tax code. These little things that kind of give us deductions or maybe exempt certain kinds of income. Uh, those are things that the, the tax code is trying to build in to achieve a social goal. The flip side of that coin might be a, an economic goal. The government will sometimes try to use a, our tax code to achieve certain economic goals like maybe it wants to the government wants to reduce unemployment 
uh, or maybe they want to expand investment by business. So they give businesses a tax break when they buy property. Or maybe they want businesses to expand research and development to come up with new technologies. So they give a tax break for research and development. And so, you know, there's kind of a blurred line there between social goals and economic goals. But the idea is the goal of the U.S. tax system isn't just to get as much money for the federal government as possible. It's also to build these things into the tax code that will help us achieve certain goals that we might have as a society. So, back to the main point at hand here, there are five filing entities that your textbook talks about. Individuals, corporations, partnerships, and estates and trusts. We are focusing our time in class for the most part, all on individual taxpayers. Individuals file the Form 1040. Now, you, you may say, well, I remember my parents used to file a 1040A, or, well, in my first job, I filed a 1040EZ. Those forms are gone now. Uh, with the new tax law that went into effect in 2018, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it eliminated those simpler 1040 forms under the guise that they've simplified the 1040 form so they don't need other simpler forms. In fact, in 2018, the IRS boasted that you could fit your return on a form the size of a postcard. That lasted one year and they phased that out. And what you're looking at now is what we're going to use in 2019, the draft form for 2019 returns. It'll be filed in 2020. Uh, but this is the individual income tax return. There's just a 1040 now. As you can see, you got information at the top, your name, social security number, your spouse's name, social security number, all that good stuff. And then you've got your wages down here and you've got your line for standard deduction and kind of mix that all together. You get taxable income and we're going to, you're going to be so familiar with this form at the end of the class. It's not very funny. So don't freak out if you're looking at this and thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have all this memorized right now. You will by the end of the class, believe me. Uh, and then finally, here's page number two. You can see your tax is carried over there and you Got your uh, refund, or I'm sorry, your payments and credits that you put in during the year, and your total payments, the amount you've overpaid, or the amount you owe, and a place to sign it. It looks like a pretty straightforward form, so you might be sitting there thinking, okay, well, uh, the 1040 is only two pages. We're going to spend an entire class learning how to do a tax form that only has two pages. Well, unfortunately, it's not just the two pages that I showed you right there there are supporting schedules that go along with it. So if you really kind of took a close look at some of these lines on the 1040, you might notice that it says like uh, other income from Schedule 1. Adjustments to income from Schedule 1. Well, what the heck is Schedule 1? On the second page, other taxes from Schedule 2. And so we got all these different schedules that it's referencing. So those are other forms that go along with the 1040. And yeah, we're going to look at all of those too throughout the time we have together in uh, Accounting 2210. But just to give you a quick overview, and I'm not going to read them to you, but you can see the 1040 has one through six schedules right there. And those are new from the tax uh, law in 2018. Schedule A, Schedule B, C, D, and E are all the same as they were before the new tax law. So we'll be covering all of these, but just be aware that the 1040, the two page document that I showed you just now, that's not all there is to it. There's going to be all kinds of schedules that give supplementary information to that form. Corporations file form 1120. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act created a flat 21% tax rate for all corporations. Before it was a progressive tax rate, the bottom bracket was 15% and it went up to 38%. Uh, as the corporation earned more and more money. So you can kind of see right here the income and the deductions for the corporation. It looks pretty simple uh, just on the surface there, but it's actually a pretty long return. I'm going to kind of scroll through here and show you. We've got a schedule attached right there for page number two. Separate page where we're going to calculate the tax and the payments that have been made. Other information, we're going to give them a balance sheet per our accounting records. We're going to reconcile our income per books with the income we show on the tax return. So there's a lot going on on that corporate return. We are going to have one chapter on corporate returns in our class. 
and you need to be aware that that is really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, those of you that are on the four-year track uh, after Southern State or maybe going to sit for the CPA exam, you'll definitely want to take tax two uh, wherever you end up going because that's what's going to cover corporate and partnership taxation. Uh, we just really scrapped you know, that tip of the iceberg, a really broad overview. In that overview, we'll also talk about partnerships. Partnerships file form 1065, and a partnership is not a taxable entity. They don't pay tax at the partnership level. What happens is that in, uh, return is just an informational return. We're just giving the IRS that return so the IRS knows the total amount of income or loss that that partnership had and how it's being split up between all the partners. All that information from the 1065, the partnership return, goes to the individual partner's return according to their share of the partnership. So, you know, if the partnership has four partners and they all have a 25% share of the income, that total income will be reported on the partnership return. It will show in a form called Form K-1 how that income breaks down to the individual partners. That way the IRS can go look for that income as those individual partner 1040s come in. So we get one chapter on partnerships. Estates and trusts file form 1041. That's beyond the scope of the individual tax class. Again, if you take a, a tax two at another institution, you'll probably touch on estates and trusts a little bit more. And then finally, your book doesn't really talk about it, but you may not even know or be aware, but not-for-profit organizations have to file a tax return too, in some cases. And I can remember when I was in public accounting in my first year, I had worked on an audit for Second Harvest Food Bank in Tennessee. And after the audit, one of the managers comes up and says, hey, you need to do the 990 for Second Harvest. And I was like, I thought they were hazing me. I thought it was like some kind of, you know, play a joke on the rookie kind of thing. Oh, the 990, you know, ha ha. And so I was like, okay, well, what's the 990? He says, well, it's the tax return. And I'm ah, now I'm really confused because I'm like, well, wait a second, they don't pay any taxes. They don't have a tax return. It turns out <laughs> the nonprofits do. It's an informational return. Basically, it just talks about the money that came in, the money that went out the door, and there's a little bit of a, a balance sheet on there that they fill out, not unlike that corporation return that I showed you. Uh, the reason that these are filed is just to, so the IRS can make sure that the not-for-profit is uh, kind of maintaining its original um, charter that makes it a not-for-profit. So if a not-for-profit gets involved in things that they aren't set up to do, uh, and maybe like political things uh, that are outside the scope of the organization, they may end up being subject to tax. But the 990 is an informational return. If you ever want to see a, a not-for-profit's 990, you can go to a website called guidestar.org, a really neat website where you can pull up financial information on almost any not-for-profit organization you can think of. So, that's all for our video right now. Our next video, we'll look at the tax calculation and how that tax calculation is built into Form 1040 for individuals. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. The information is in the syllabus and on Canvas, and we'll see you next time.